writing under the pen name of Martha Lavalley, Summersworth resident. I'm sorry, I have like twisted tongue here. Summersworth resident and newly published author has just come out with her new book, An Only Child No More. Discovering her new family at 54. Is that part of your? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, this poignant, uplifting memoir describes the emotional journey of a middle-aged woman who receives an unexpected email and suddenly learns that her now deceased parents have kept a secret from her, the fact that she has a half-brother. Raised as an only child, the revelation occurs without any DNA testing of anyone in the family. This true story describes her coming to terms with the shocking information as she remembers vague clues from her childhood. I am going to let Martha fill us in more and not give any secrets away. <laughs> and I also wanted to let you know that after the presentation, her book is here if you'd like to purchase it. And we have a copy in the library as well. And it's currently out. So please welcome Martha Lavalley. Thank, Thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming out this evening, on this hot evening, and for showing interest in my story. Uh, my real name, uh, Summersworth resident Mary Jane Lavoie, um, my maiden name was Mary Jane Rogers, but my pen name is Martha Lavalley. Um, I chose to use uh, a pen name for a little bit of privacy. Um, and also, my brother had some concerns about the possibility of folks with some rather unusual ideas uh, reading the book and thinking that our family situation is terrible and sinful and they might try to do harm to his children or grandchildren. And so almost all of the names in the book have been changed and many of the place names in the book as well have, have been changed. I never thought of myself as a writer. Um, I, my major in, in Keene State College was math education, so I never expected to be, to be writing a book and never focusing on English as a major, that's for sure. But after 2014, I thought of myself as someone with one incredible story to tell. And now with this book, I have told it. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about myself before I get into the details of the book. Um, after graduating from Keene State, um, I worked as a junior actuarial analyst for Blue Cross Blue Shield's administrative organization for about a year and a half, but I didn't find that line of work to be terribly interesting. And I was lucky enough to get a job working in higher ed where I found my passion. I was hired as the office manager of the registrar's office at Hawthorne College in Antrim, New Hampshire. And I was promoted to registrar a little less than a year later. I was registrar there when they announced that they were closing for financial difficulties. Then I became assistant director of Franklin Pierce College's coastal campus, which at that time was on the Dover Summersworth city line. And most of my duties involved advising students. I was promoted to the campus director position a few months later and worked there for about four and a half years. And then I became registrar at Bradford College in Haverhill, Mass, which I absolutely loved. They had a very eclectic student body uh, for a very small campus. They had a number of international students. It was a great place to work, but unfortunately after about six and a half years, they too announced that they were closing for financial difficulties. Then I switched to become registrar at Notre Dame College in Manchester, New Hampshire, and about two years later, they announced that they were closing for financial difficulties. <laughs> so I'm not allowed to be a registrar anywhere <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but thankfully, I was able to get a job advising students at the College for Lifelong Learning in Rochester, which later changed its name to Granite State College. And I worked there from November 2002 until my retirement in March of 2021. When COVID hit in March of 2020, all staff at Granite State College were sent home to work from home. So that was a nice one year of transition for my husband who had already been retired for a number of years and he had the house to himself and then suddenly I was at home but chained to the kitchen table working 40 hours a week. <laughs> and then after a year I decided to uh, 
to take the, the leap and retire as well. So. so when I retired, that gave me the time to finish the book that I had started working on back in 2016. So uh, trying to have a sedentary full-time job and finish writing the book didn't work very well. So I finally finished it. Um, and so that was my career in a nutshell. As you can tell from the title, An Only Child No More, Discovering My New Family at 54, all my life I believed I was an only child. I grew up in a very small town where there were many more trees than people. Not only was I born and raised in this small town, but my father was also born and raised in that same small down, town, and his father was also born and raised in that very small town, which I call Carterville, Maine, in the story. And in the book, I'm Martha Rollins LaValley. My dad is Lawrence Rollins, and my mother is Rose Rollins. My dad, which is the little boy at the front of this rail car, was the middle child of five. And they had a rather unique upbringing in that they were born and raised in a small railroad depot. My grandfather was a fireman for the B&M Railroad. That's him holding his fifth child <laughs> and the other four sitting on the rail car there. My dad had an older sister and older brother. He was the middle child and he had two younger sisters. And there's the small railroad depot where they all grew up. My grandfather was a fireman and used that rail car to follow behind the trains, making sure that sparks didn't catch the, the grass and trees on fire. And he also helped with loading and unloading supplies and uh, freight and so forth. My grandmother also worked for the B&M Railroad. She ran the telegraph machine there in the depot and she sold tickets to the passengers. That's a little bit better photo of the depot and the barn. As you can see, it was right next to the railroad tracks. And my dad and his siblings as adults would tell funny stories about how they you know, had got into all sorts of mischief around the train tracks. And it's amazing, none of them ever got seriously hurt. I can't imagine bringing up five little kids in a railroad depot. My mother was raised on a dairy farm, small dairy farm uh, that was on the outskirts of the city nearest the small town where my dad grew up. They met and started dating when my mother was 17 and my dad was 21. There's a cute little story in the book about what my dad did when he went to call on my mom for the first time and instead of she opening the door, her mother opened the door. And what my father did at that point is rather quite funny. My parents eloped on April 20th, 1940, this snapshot was taken the day that they eloped. My mom was 18 and my dad was 22. I assume from the background that this was taken at the dairy farm where my mom grew up. This was their official wedding photo that was taken a few weeks later. They were very happy newlyweds in uh, 1940. Um, and about a year or so later, my mom learned that she was pregnant and she was absolutely thrilled. She was so looking forward to becoming a mother. Now that she was a wife, she very much wanted to become a mother. But unfortunately, she suffered a miscarriage and it was far enough along into the pregnancy that they knew that the baby would have been a boy. And she was devastated, but they were still very young. They had a whole lot of time ahead of them to have other children. And this was all right around late 1941. And as we know from our American history lessons, December 7th, 1941, the bombing of Pearl Harbor occurred. And that's when the U.S. entered into World War II. Well, in 1942, my dad decided to enlist in the Army. And part of his reason for doing so was his hope that his older brother, who was married with one child and a second one on the way by that point, would be spared from the draft. Uh, so my father at that point had a wife but no children, whereas his older brother had a wife and two ch one child and a second one about to be born. So I don't know if there was any correlation, but his hope worked out 
as he expected, uh, his theory came true in that he went into the army, but his older brother was spared from, from going into the service. And when my dad went into the military, my mom moved back to the dairy farm and lived with her parents while daddy was in the service. This photo was taken in November of 43. He had gone through his basic training and so forth and was home for, for leave just before um, his extended time in the military. It's difficult to see, but there's a blue star hanging in the window. So the, the, my grandparents were a blue star family at that point. My dad's on the end and his four siblings and their spouses are all in this picture as well. And at that point, my Grandpa and Grammy had three grandchildren, a granddaughter and a grandson. The grandson was the son of my uncle and his wife, and she's holding the little baby girl there. And my mom took the photograph. She's not in it. These were taken in 44 when my dad was home on leave, again at his parents' house. This is his little nephew who was so happy to have a uniform very similar to his uncle's. Uncle Lawrence. <laughs> and this photo of my parents, if you look at the cover of my memoir, it's at the very top with the faces blurred. But it was a, a photo of my mom and dad when my dad was home from leave. My dad served in Europe uh, from uh, early 1943 until May of 1946. This photo of my dad standing here in the middle with two other of his army troop mates, um, was taken in Germany after the war was over. Uh, my, my dad was in the service helping build roads and bridges, loading lumber, guarding prisoners, a variety of duties while serving in Europe. Uh, he brought uh, home with him, or had sent to him after he got home, a, a, an army yearbook. Uh, it was the A Company of the 245th Engineer Combat Battalion description and some of what he and his fellow A Company members went through is described in the book. When the war was officially over, he and his A Company were sent to Germany to help with the reconstruction of that country. And this, in these photos he's working on building and painting a newly built bridge and this photo was taken in Germany and while he was serving in the army over there in Germany he met a woman and even though he was married to my mother at the time he fathered a child but because the child wasn't born until November of 1946 and my dad was discharged in May of 1946. He never got to see his son or hold his baby son or know his son growing up. But he did know about the boy's existence and my mother knew about the boy's existence. I don't know exactly when she found out about the boy's existence but she knew and from what I can surmise my parents separated for a while over this and it must have been a condition of their getting back together that I'm sure my mom must have insisted that he not have any more communication with his former girlfriend or his son and that my mother was adamant I never learned this horrible scandalous secret. So the book starts with how I learned about all of this. Uh, my dad passed away in 1997 from cancer. My mom passed away in 2009 from heart disease. They had ample opportunities to <laughs> tell me about this, but neither of them ever did. So the first chapter of my book is how it began. And it starts on Wednesday, April 9th, 2014, where I'm sitting in my office at Granite State College in Rochester, checking my emails. And in my inbox is this email from a strange young man from Germany. So, Dear Mrs. Lavallee, my name is Samuel. I am 26 and from Cologne, Germany. 
It might sound weird, but I am looking for a man who was named Lawrence Rollins. While researching, I found your name connected to him. I might be totally wrong, but if so, please, please let me know. In this case, I would explain more to you. This is no spam or anything. For me, this is an incredible, important research, and you might be my only chance. I hope you receive this mail and answer me. Yours, Samuel Graf, Cologne, Germany. So I thought this was just some spam email that had made its way through the spam, the college's spam filter. And I printed it off and showed a colleague of mine and said, would you even bother to respond to this or would you just throw it away? And she says, well, I don't know. Is that your father's name? Yes. And it's spelled right, too. <laughs> so so I, I thought about it for a while and then I finally decided to cautiously respond to this email. Hello, Samuel. What is your research? My father was Lawrence Rollins, now deceased. Martha Rollins Lavallee. Well, the very next day, I received a second email from this young man, April 10th, 2014. Hello, Mrs. Lavallee. Thank you so much for answering. At first, I must excuse myself if my English is not that good, but I hope you will understand me. I found your name after a long research. I am looking for someone who could know Lawrence Rollins for years now. The only thing I got is an address. Rollins, Lawrence, Carterville, P.O. Maine, Box 14. The internet getting bigger and bigger, filled with more information, helped me now to find your name. Anyway, I'm not sure if your father is the Lawrence Rollins I am looking for. I want to tell you the reason for my research. Even if it's confusing, I don't want anything bad. To be honest, I am looking for my grandfather. Well, at this point, I just stopped reading. <laughs> I could feel the anger bubble up and quickly inside of me, and my stomach twisted into a knot. My breathing became deeper and more forceful, and I had a hard time focusing on anything while my mind raced, thoughts tumbling over one another. When I read that he was searching for his grandfather and implying that my father was his grandfather, I became boiling mad. I was just furious. How could this stranger even suggest that my father had cheated on my mother? Daddy would have never cheated on Ma. He was a good and honorable man. He loved her, they loved each other, and me very much. He never would have done such a terrible thing. I closed the email and tried to go about my work and put this stranger's insinuations out of my mind, but I had difficulty focusing on the tasks for my job. So I'll let you read the book to find out exactly what convinced me. <laughs> but um, finally, I was convinced that what he was saying was true. After reading the entire letter, even though Daddy did not specifically state that he was speaking about his son, I knew that he cared about both Gretchen and her son. And then I, auto I opened the attachment of the old black and white photo of Samuel's father. This nice looking blonde man was, uh, I first noticed his dark eyes and dark eyebrows, which did not look like my father. But as I took in this man's entire face, the lower half jumped out at me as resembling my dad. This man had daddy's mouth and chin and similar hair and the same shape of his face and head, and the same ears. I was absolutely stunned. This man had a deeper cleft in the middle of his chin than Daddy did, but the mouth looked just exactly the same. And although I did not have Daddy's military photo with me there at work, I remembered quite well what he looked like in it. Comparing it with this photo now staring back at me from the computer screen, the resemblance was incredible. I felt like an explosion had gone off in my body and my adrenaline level shot through the roof. I could barely catch my breath. My father had a son. I have a half-brother. I was absolutely ecstatic to learn this news. So it, it took quite a while for me to comprehend that I actually was not an only child. I had grown up in a very rural area and was a little bit on the lonely side growing up with no siblings and no friends nearby to you know, get together with regularly. But I actually did have a half-brother on the other side of the world. At first, I was angry with my father for having cheated on my mother and how difficult it must have been for my mother to know that she hadn't been able to give her husband a child at this point, but he had had a son with another woman. And then after three or four weeks, I started gradually becoming less angry with him and becoming more angry with my mother for having prevented my dad from ever knowing his son and for keeping the secret from me. 
there's a whole chapter in the book about little hints that were dropped for me as I was growing up that if I'd had any inkling of this, I could have picked up on. But uh, the, the little jigsaw puzzle pieces that I had come across <laughs> as little hints didn't make sense to me. I didn't realize that they were all connected. Obviously, my parents worked through this, uh, otherwise I wouldn't be here today. But um, from what my nephew had told me, my brother never received any letters from my dad, so I don't think there was ever any communication between my father and his, his son, after I was born at least. And I'm sh sure that my mother must have insisted no communication with his ex-girlfriend. I did learn from my nephew that my brother doesn't speak much English. My nephew um, learned English in school over there in Germany, but at the time my, my brother was born in 1946, they weren't teaching English in schools, so he knows a little bit of English, he can understand a little bit of English, but he speaks very little. So I wanted to grab my passport and fly over there to get to meet my family, but it didn't make sense to go over there and then just sit and stare at him, not be able to communicate with him, so I had to learn some German. <laughs> and so I took the next 18 months working on Rosetta Stone software, learning to speak and understand a little bit of German. Um, we were communicating regularly with my nephew, who wanted to know all about his American grandfather. Um, my husband said, well, ideally, at least one of them would come here and meet us on our turf before we go traipsing across the world to a country where we don't speak the language and don't know any of these people. And as it worked out, that was what happened. Um, after several video chats with my nephew, he and his girlfriend came to visit us for a long weekend. Her best girlfriend was working as an au pair in Boston at that time. And so thankfully, they came to spend New, Year New Year's Eve in New York City, went to visit her girlfriend for a few days, and then the girlfriend drove up the, t the couple to meet us in Portsmouth, and we had a nice long weekend together. I took them, took them on a drive for Lawrence Rollins Day on a Saturday and showed them the location where the uh, railroad depot had set. It had burned in late 1940, so there was nothing left to show them of that, but they could see the small town where I grew up and my dad grew up, take them to the cemetery where my parents are buried, tell them some stories about my, my dad's youth and so forth. So we had a very nice visit with them. And that visit went so well that my husband agreed, okay, now let's go meet your family. <laughs> so the following Christmas, we flew and, and spent Christmas and New Year's with my brother and his current wife and my brother's two daughters and two sons, and at the time, one granddaughter. Now there's a second granddaughter and a grandson. So I have two nieces, two nephews, two grandnieces and a grandnephew at this point. So the family is ever expanding. I, in talking with um, a veteran who had served in wartime, he explained how lonely it can be when you're serving in a war um, and you don't know if you're gonna make it back in one piece or not and how difficult the situation is. You just really don't know what's gonna happen and you see some terrible things. So it's very possible that this woman might have helped my dad get through it all and come back as great a person as he was. He might not have come back that way or have come back at all if it hadn't been for her. Seeing a counselor helped me to, to recognize that. Um, and so, I'm th I, first I was angry with my dad. He did what he felt he had to do. Then I was angry with my mom. She handled the situation the best she felt she could. This was in the 1940s and 50s and 60s. Society was very different at that time than, than it is today. Um, much less accepting of out-of-wedlock children. And certainly my brother grew up in war-torn Germany, so he had his struggles as well. And then me finding out all of this shocking information on, on a random April day in 2014. So at this point, I'm, I'm not angry with anybody. I'm just thrilled that uh, I have this whole new family. And the moral of the story is you never know what's going to happen to you one day when you wake up. It could provide an opportunity to 
drastically improve your life if you're willing to, to take advantage of the opportunity. So that's my story in a nutshell. <laughs> I am happy to try and answer some questions. This is uh, only the third author event I've done, and so I'm still learning how many details to share to get people interested in buying the book, but not share so many details that they walk away saying, I don't need to buy the book. I've learned everything I needed to know. <laughs> yeah. So how long did it take you to kind of make peace with this whole situation? I mean, like, you know, picked up bits and pieces. I would say about a year. Um, I, I kept notes when all this was happening, and after you know, learning some German and, and going over there, and the visit was so, you know, we were so well received, so, so wonderful, I said, I've got to write about this. <laughs> this is a book. Mm -hmm. And so, but I, I really need to, to be okay with the whole situation before I really started writing. Uh, and so what prompted you to see a therapist or a counselor? I couldn't sleep. My, I, w I would wake up in the night and my thoughts would be racing, trying to remember what clues could I have possibly missed. And, and I remembered some. <laughs> but yeah, I wasn't sleeping very well at all. And um, so I, I figured seeing a counselor to, to help me get through these emotions was the best thing to do. Do you think your parents left clues intentionally or you just picked up on them? I think, I think I think my dad really wanted me to know, to and know. yeah, yeah um, my my mom did have a really bad heart attack in 1994, and we almost lost her a couple of times. And I think that if she had passed away at that time, and my dad was diagnosed that same year with terminal cancer, yeah. I think he would have told me. I think he promised her he would never tell. They didn't uh, leave anything in in their wills. No, yeah. no. And as their only child, I cleaned out the house I grew up in right. when my mom went into a nursing home. And she had 12 years, well, 10 years. Um, she was, she lived 12 years after my dad passed away, but she had 10 years in the house. And she had a decade to get rid of anything that she didn't want me to find. Okay. Wow. So. Did you ever meet um, your brother's mom? Yeah. Did she still alive? She passed away when he was 20. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, he was quite young when she passed away. And she never, she never married. She didn't? Did she ever have any other kids? Nope. Oh, wow. Nope. Well, I can't wait to read it. <laughs> 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 I mean, wow. Wow. Maybe yep. your father had two great loves. Yes. Yep. Maybe. Yep. That's okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Have you had subsequent visits? Yes. Um, we visited in the Christmas, New Year's 2015-2016. Um, in the summer of 2017, my eldest niece and her husband and their little daughter came to visit us. They came to New York City and spent some time visiting in the city and then came to visit us. I uh, took them to Storyland and places that a five-year-old <laughs> would enjoy. And then in May of 2018, my brother um, was starting to lose his eyesight and really wanted to show me where he grew up, and I was thrilled to see where he grew up. So my husband and I went back over there in May of 2018, and my brother and his niece, who were the least proficient in English, <laughs> took the two of my husband and I, the two of us, to Berlin and showed us around Berlin to different areas where he had grown up, different apartment buildings where he had had grown up, uh, showed me the cemetery where his aunt, who had died a few years earlier, is buried. Um, and she was like a surrogate mother to him after his real mom passed away. So I was thrilled to be able to see places of note to him. And then my niece and her family were going to come back to visit us in summer 2020, which of course did not happen with COVID. Um, so at this point, we're hoping, planning, if all goes well, we will go back in June of 2023, next June. So. How's your German? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's been rusty and since COVID. I have not kept up with it. So, um, so yeah, I, I really need to get back into Rosetta Stone before we head over there next June. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where do they live? Uh, they live outside of Cologne. Yeah, Cologne's the cl nearest big city for them. And, and my, my brother 
he's retired now. He's turning 76 this fall. And so he's been out of politics for a while, but he was in politics for a little while. And so that may be part of why he's so concerned about the safety of his children and grandchildren. Uh, I don't know, but he, he said he didn't mind if I wrote a book, but he didn't want any real names of his family used. And that's why I'm not showing pictures of my brother, too. But I can tell you, he looks a lot like the gentleman in the middle there. <laughs> <laughs> gentleman who had Alzheimer's but has since passed away he used to I would if anybody would ever ask and say you know how many kids you have and he would always say four that I know of yes. <laughs> so I'm not sure it's completely unique yeah but well there's the term war babies right and right. so this happens evidently quite yeah. frequently but how often the progeny finds know? you know yeah. the uh, American soldier fathers, who knows? But people can't understand, well, how did you learn all this without any DNA testing? It's like, you just look at the pictures and <laughs> you don't need DNA testing. No, but it took some convincing for me to believe that this young man who emailing me was telling me the truth. My book is available for sale. I don't have credit card machine, but I have change for cash. Um, and there's also uh, postcards for anybody that's interested in you know, taking a free postcard to think about it more uh, or spread the word to your friends and family. You know, these are free for the taking. Uh, Very good. Well, thank you. Yes, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's really a good read. <laughs> yeah. It's good. And it's just under 200 pages, so it's a pretty quick read.